<laughs> I would like to ask Sheridan if you might like to pop up here for one moment. Um, Ray and Sheridan are, are our pastors down at Encounter Levin, and she is here. I've just invited her up so you can see how very beautiful she is and to welcome her here with us this morning. <laughs> and thank you, Sheridan. And I just thought when you arrived, some of your boys are much taller than you now. <laughs> I just had to look twice. Um, and not, I just wanted to say, not only have they grown, but so have you and Ray, and your faith, and the work, and the people's lives that you have touched. And Levin, you're welcome here today. Thank you so much for coming. Wow. <laughs> and if um, Donna and Tony just wish to stand where they are, look, they're back. <laughs> they are there. He's always had a fan club, Tony has. That's wonderful. Lovely to see Dorothy and Ron here. Um, Kevin's dad, you're very special to us and one of um, our daughters are here today, Charmaine is back, Dorothy, so you might like to check her out, see what Gordon, my father, would think of her. Um, Dorothy is the only person who knew my parents um, when they were young farmers up north. We were all a little bit mad on tractors and trucks and I really just wanted to be a truck driver, that's all I wanted to do. But here I am, here, <laughs> doing something quite different for God, isn't that wonderful? But... Um, Welcome, and if you're watching online, welcome. And the word I have is not only for the people sitting before me today, but every person watching here online, no matter where in the country or in the world you are today. My message is a simple one. I actually heard these words come to me in my sleep. He is not here. He is risen. Wow. Wow. Jesus, the Son of God, is not here. He is risen. And it's a powerful, powerful statement that sits right there in Luke chapter 24 and verse 6. And I welcome all the youth here this morning who have stayed in. And I trust that what I say will also speak to your young lives and give you this powerful message that Jesus is not here. He is risen. He has gone to that place where God, his heavenly father is. And we read in the story how that when he was crucified, his body had just been left, maybe on the cross, maybe taken down from the cross by the guards. And <clears throat> it tells us that a man, Joseph of Arimathea, who was looking for the kingdom of God, the scriptures tell us, so he was observing some of these things. He hadn't even really known Jesus, but he owned a tomb that had been freshly cut out for when he had died and when he wished to use it. Maybe the disciples were so distraught about what had happened to Jesus that none of them thought what was going to happen to his body. But Joseph of Arimathea knew, and he had this tomb with a big stone cut out that had never been used <coughs> And on his own, with the help of some of the women, he got this body and wrapped it in the linen clothes that they used for burial and took him into his own tomb there and shut what was the stone in front of it and left it. And the scriptures tell us there that <clears throat> after that happened, some of the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, who had been responsible for the death of Jesus, and said, this Jesus that has just died on this cross is still a danger to us. He's been a danger to our religious system because he's gone around here for three and a half years healing people, setting people free, and has this multitude of followers and do you remember, Pilate, that he went around saying that he would be crucified and in three days' time he would rise again? <clears throat> you have got to get your guards to go along to that tomb and seal it and guard it for the next three days in case he rose again from the dead. So the disciples didn't think this would happen 
But my goodness, the religious leaders of the day definitely thought this was possible. <coughs> and that should Jesus become alive, they would have more unrest and more disorder than what was currently happening in that day. And so he gave orders. He put a sealant around the stone and he put his guards there to guard them took action. He wasn't going to leave anything to chance. The next day, it tells us, it was the Sabbath. And at least three of the women who are named there, Mary of Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Joanna, and one of the other versions said, and some others went, because they had seen Jesus be put in the tomb. They had gone home and they prepared their spices and their embalming oils so that they could go back to embalm him and prepare him for, for being sealed permanently in the tomb. So they went back, it says on that day, and the number of things that happened as they arrived at this tomb is outstanding because God saw to it that the whole earth shook. There was an earthquake that happened there was an appearance of, of, of this, this being that it says shot out shafts and rays of light. Must have been something like off the Star Wars episode or something like that. It was huge. This, this was happening in front of their eyes. And sitting on the stone which had been moved from the opening of this tomb was somebody who spoke to them, this being with this light around them. The guards were shocked. The guards collapsed. The guards said that they looked like dead men. I love this. I thought, yes, that is really cool. That is cool. That one, one bolt of, of God's angelic lightning and the ground shook was all they needed to completely collapse and know that there was a greater power presented here than anywhere else they had ever seen in that religious system. And sitting on the very rock, I don't know why I like that so much. I think it's just a casual look, but it's just a dominant thing as well. This stone is not going to keep Jesus in there. A, a, a being has come from God, moved that stone, and he has dominance over that stone. I'm speaking to you right now and on the internet. If you think that God can't move the blockages in your life and bring areas of your life to life, you are mistaken. He can do it. He can do it. He can move that stone away and dominate and sit on that thing so it never goes back to block your life and your circumstances ever again in Jesus' name. And this is why Brent calls me his favorite preacher. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> and I think I have just seen something. Is it? Sasa there beside you, Diane, or what? Sasa, it is you, my precious. Is that? Yes. Sasa is actually here. <laughs> Look at that. Stand up, Sasa. She was uh, the bride yesterday. Oh, what a moment. You know, Jesus is risen and Sasa is here. It's just all happening for me this morning, isn't it? Uh, Sasa, you were beautiful, and you are today, but yesterday, beautiful. I have to say it, beauty should not be underestimated, Brent. This one <laughs> that sat on the stone with shards of light coming out said and spoke, come and see the place where he lay. And they did. The woman walked through, looked in, saw where he was, saw these grave clothes folded and came out again and the angel spoke again and said go quickly tell the disciples Jesus is going to go to Galilee and there you will all see him Amen. why Galilee out of all the places to go this was seven miles away from Jerusalem why Galilee because God knew that the minute those stunned guards came 
out of a state of semi-consciousness, if not complete unconsciousness, they would go back and talk to the religious leaders and the Pharisees about what they had saw, and nobody would be safe from the Roman rule. And that is, of course, exactly what happened. But these women went, and they went at speed because they'd seen something miraculous, they'd felt the ground shake, they'd seen an angelic being that spoke to them and told them what to do. And on the road, Jesus was there and said, hello, my goodness. They fell down and worshipped him right there and then. This is all getting almost too much for them. This is one thing after another, after another. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell my disciples to leave for Galilee and there I will meet them shortly. So they've been told twice. They didn't need to be told a third time. They probably hitched up their dress things they used to wear and rushed to tell the others what was happening. Meanwhile, the guards woke. They went to the chief priests and elders. They had the story about they, of what had happened and told them. They didn't like this. There was no way they wanted word out in that community that Jesus had risen and was no longer there. The body wasn't there. So the guards were given money and bribed and told to say that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body in the middle of the night when they were asleep. There was no way they wanted anybody to know that a sealed stone had been moved aside, that the body was no longer there, then an angel had come and sat on the stone and they, conscious or half conscious, had witnessed this thing that could not get out into the community. That story of the disciples removing the body of Jesus is still there to this very day. The women, on the other hand, burst into the room with the, where the disciples all were they were excited. Oh dear, very excited. Probably all talking at once, probably all semi-shocked, probably just tumbling out their words. Each version in Matthew, Mark and Luke records the same thing, that these women were talking no sense, nonsense, <laughs> and making idle chatter, and none of them believed anything that they said. It seems to be that not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. I am just saying that I like this because sometimes us girls know things. Oh, yes. <laughs> sometimes God tells us girls things. Sometimes he shows us things. And sometimes even we just know things and we get so excited. Yes, it's taken me nearly 50 years to train my good man that I, if I should burst upon him excited about something that he should stop doing whatever he's doing on that thing he works on the computer and listen, because maybe I just know some things. I don't know why they don't actually get it from the start, but I do know if I burst upon him, if he's with a few mates, and there's a few of us girls, my noisy sisters or something like that coming to burst in, they are not going to listen to that. They are just not going to listen. And, and, you know, you've got to get round that some way. I've got many ways, ladies, of, of getting my point across. If ever you come to me in private, I've got quite a few ways. But that's, <laughs> that's far from the point today. Because, oh, dear. <laughs> He's fabulously funny today, isn't he? <laughs> but God had revealed himself to this excited clutch of women, all tumbling this out. One out of 11 went to check that grave to see if what they were saying was true. That's Peter. He's my kind of guy. He went and had a look and saw that this was true what they'd said, the stone had been moved, 
there was nothing there but these grave clothes. And he marvelled and he wondered and he walked away. <clears throat> he was not there. He is risen. Amen. Hallelujah. The angel said to the women, he is not here. He is risen. And I'm going to show a quick video now. But it's a video about when he next revealed himself to two as they walked along the road. Thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> Slow down. Slow down. We're far enough from Jerusalem. We're just, we're just two pilgrims on the road. If anyone asks us. We were in Jerusalem for Passover. We, we heard of this Jesus. We saw him preaching in the temple, but... But we never saw him. Oh, Galilean, so... Maybe, maybe we heard him preach. We heard he was from Galilee. Who's that you're talking about? Jesus of Nazareth. What about him? He was some sort of teacher. Some pilgrims thought he was the leader come to free us. So they said to us. He was condemned and handed over to the Romans. So? He was crucified. And now they said he's come back to life. <laughs> <laughs> You don't believe the scriptures. Why do you say this? Isaiah wrote that the Son of God will come to earth. You'll know human death at the hands of men. Surely Jesus told you these things would happen. I heard such things. You're slow to believe. My brother's house is this way. Why don't you stop with us for some food? Come. Come and eat with us. What are you doing? This is the bread of life. This is my body, given up for you. This is my blood, poured out the healing of others. There's a message in all of us for each of us today. He's on your road. Before you know it, he's there. He's on your road in every one of your circumstances. He's with you. God was with you, Violet, before that ever appeared. He's been on your road all along. These are ordinary men that we're not even sure if the actual actually his disciples. One name was Cleopas, only mentioned once in this incident. Uh, who the other one was? This was not Peter, James and John, who he revealed himself to after seeing the women. These were ordinary men, frightened and unsure of what was happening in that world around them. Jesus chose these men 
to send us a message and a truth. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where on your spiritual journey you are with Jesus. Whether you are like his disciples, his three, or whether you're starting this journey today, or whether you have not made that decision, he is on your road, and you, he is there before you know it. He is there, the person of Jesus is there, because several days after this happened, he told his disciples, wait, my Holy Spirit will come to you and they felt it and they never looked back and did amazing things. That Holy Spirit is there for each one of us today because He is not here. He is risen, but He has said something to each of us that is on our road every second of our life through every circumstance. Let me tell you, there is significance in talking together. On that road, there were two men talking before Jesus appeared to them. Tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. Two of you talking on that road as touching anything and agree on it, means that God can take action. That verse is preceded by whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. If you are talking with someone on your road and agree and bind something that is not the works of God, it is bound in heaven by God. If you are walking on that road and want some blessing to be loosed in people's lives, it is already loosed in heaven, the scripture tells us. How often are you on your road, unaware that that presence is there in the person of the Holy Spirit, and you begin to talk with someone in agreement and unity about a situation, and before you know it, it is already changed and already passed. And now, when I talk to many of you, I sit sometimes and listen and agree with you. Because no matter if I think that you might be in the right or in the wrong, I'm agreeing with you because you're wanting the situation to change. If two of you agree, God can do amazing things. Agreement causes God to act makes him act, gives him the right to act. Some of the things that we talk about with each other on the road as those two men were walking are eternal. But just as Jesus appeared to them, he is in those conversations we have. You see, you touch some things on earth. Whatever you touch on earth and agree activates God in heaven. Let me outline just a couple of things. Whatever you touch on earth will be done in heaven. We touch this presence. We cannot physically touch Jesus as they could because he is not here, he is risen. But we touch that person of the Holy Spirit within our spirit and the sense of him around us. We touch the truth of what Jesus represents, the truth of eternal and saved life forever. And we touch in our very minds and our eyes those hands of which were pierced with those nails as a reminder that He is the one who heals. And praise God for your healing, Violet. Let's hear a mighty praise one more time for what He has done in here. <clears throat> That's what we can do. If two of you agree as touching anything on earth will be done in heaven. This is what Jesus does. When he met these two walking along, he allowed them to talk. 
He was on their road. He was in their situation. That is my message to you today. You might not know it, but He is right there when two of you are talking, when you're having your conversations and agreeing, when you're outlining your difficult situation as these two were. They were talking. It was horrible for them. They didn't know what was going to happen next. He didn't stop them and say, stop, I I wanna hear all this. Jesus let them talk. Did you not know? They said to Jesus that the Son of God has been crucified. We thought that He was going to be the one to be the Saviour and save this world and make our lives different and He's dead, He's gone. Jesus knew all this, but He allowed the story to come out. He even allowed the questions. They said to Him, are you the only one here that doesn't know what's happened? Do you really not know? And still He didn't say, I know. He's on your road with you every step of the way. Sometimes we're just way too busy with the chatter to even notice He is there, but He's not going to intrude as this has happened in the story. The other thing is He never quickly came up with the answers. He never said, I can tell you what's going to happen or I know what's going to happen or this is what you need to do. None of that. He waited until they invited him to come to their home for dinner. And I'm going to invite you up now, Brent, as I make my last point here. He revealed himself in the breaking of this bread. He revealed himself to them in the breaking of the body, his body, and the wine or the resemblance of the blood that was poured out. And as they touched this bread, as they took that cup of wine, their eyes were opened. They saw this is Jesus. This is our master. This is our savior. This is our healer. This is him. Every word he says is going to come to pass because He is here, but He is risen and in front. Come on. In front of their eyes, He disappeared and went to meet the disciples. He is not here. He is risen. He's on your road. What a what a what a statement. This morning, if you're here and you're not a Christian, or maybe there's issues and areas in your life of sin, unresolved conflict, this is a moment to put it right. And uh, what I would normally do after a message like that is I would invite you to come to the front and give your life to Christ, but. Actually, when they took the bread and they took the cup, their eyes were opened. And I say today, as you participate in this communion, this Lord's Supper, may your eyes be opened to the truth that Jesus Christ is alive. He sent His Holy Spirit that He might dwell within each one of us. That's what Easter is all about. It's not about bunnies and eggs and anything like that that's nonsense. It's about the fact that a Saviour came, paid the penalty for sin, broke the power of death so that you might experience His life. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to invite you in a moment to go um, to the whichever side's closest to you. Take one of the little cups and a piece of bread. Just appreciate you be careful of the car, the carpet, obviously. Um, and uh, especially if there's children, please make sure that they are looked after so we don't have anything spilt. 
but we want to have communion together and then what's going to happen is our ministry team is going to be around the tables and they're going to pray for you. So I want us to take this very seriously, very solemnly, because it is an important moment. So let's not have a lot of talk, but let's just be with a heart of meditation, a heart of just worship and love to Jesus as you go and get ready and just hold the bread, hold the cup until I have to do a couple of things. Let's do that right now. Just, just go and find a place to stand after you've taken the, the bread and cup. Just hold it in your hand and we will do it together. We will eat and drink together. if Noah could come here please If we um, just want to move closer, some of you, if you want to just come a bit closer, would be great. Addressed this moment in Corinthians. He was addressing it to a very spiritual people. There was disunity. There was all sorts of issues in the church of Corinth at the time. And he comes to chapter 11 and he begins to speak about what it is to be a Christian. And he's really looking to create unity amongst everybody and so he goes right back to the very formation of Christianity 
where Jesus came with the disciples and had the Last Supper. And Apostle Paul quotes what happened there, and I want to read it to you before we eat and drink. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this for as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And that's the reason many are weak and sick and are number sleep. But we, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If one is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together in judgment. And then he says, I'll sort out a few other things. What is he saying? When we come together, it's not a time to get boozed, to get drunk and to be gluttonous. It's a time to respect each other, to love each other, to examine our hearts toward each other as well as toward the Lord. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, this is your moment to simply say, Lord, as I eat this bread and drink this cup, I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. That's your prayer today. And you become a Christian in doing that. If you've got any issue against a person in this body here today, any offense or any issue, you must forgive them and ensure that when you leave this place, you reconcile with your brother or sister in Christ. This is not a place for any bad attitude, any unforgiveness. This is where we love each other with such sincerity and such genuineness that there can then be released healing, which is what we're going to do after we've eaten and drunk. The bread that we eat and the wine that we drink is not literally the body and it's not literally the blood of Christ, but it is symbolic. It's important that we make that distinction. This is a symbol, but it is a symbol of remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us. And as I said a few weeks ago, when I eat my piece of bread and you eat your piece of bread, it is like we are one loaf together and we are somehow symbolising our unity. And when we drink the drink, representing the, the blood of Christ, His blood flows through my veins and His blood throws you through your veins. And so we are one body with Jesus and one body together. Father, I thank You today that You died for us. We thank You that the bread represents Your body, that You allowed to be so punished and so beaten up. But we can now confidently say that Lord, You by Your stripes were healed. But Lord, You counted your, Yourself as no value except to obey the will of your Father. This body tells us and reminds us that you suffered on our behalf. And the drink that we drink today reminds us, Lord, that you spilt your blood, you shed your blood 
the pattern that was all through the Old Testament, that for there to be the forgiveness of sin, there has to be the death of an animal. There has to be the shedding of blood. And we are remembering today, you shed your blood for us, that the power of sin is broken and you got raised from the dead. The power of death is broken. And as a result, the power of the devil is broken. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church. Let's eat and drink together right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When you had that amazing moment, said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was a moment that was to change all of history. That moment has changed my life and the life of us here today. And we thank You that knowing You is not some theory, some philosophy or some man's ideas. The message of You dying for us, shedding Your blood for us, being raised from the dead, sending the Holy Spirit to us. We thank You that message lives today in our lives. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a shout of thankfulness to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Now what I want to do is I want to just take some time. If you're wanting healing of anything at all, I want you just to line up here in a, in a moment. If you want to give your life to Christ, if you haven't already done, then you come up here and we will meet with you up here. But we would just want to take this time for those of you that remain in the venue, I would appreciate we don't do a lot of talking because we want to just minister to people, minister His healing power as a result of doing communion. So let's just basically be dismissed. Tonight, don't forget, we've got a potluck tea. We're going to do communion. I'm going to share a little bit. But come on, let's just pray for those who want healing. Just come right up the front and it'll be our delight to minister to you.